Hello, um, my name is Tony DeSaul and uh, I work as an illustrator. Um, I've been working as a science illustrator um, for quite a long time as well, although I do all sorts of different types of work. I trained as a graphic designer in London at the London College of Printing quite a long time ago and uh, I've had all sorts of um, creative jobs. I've worked in advertising, um, I've worked in art colleges doing a little bit of lecturing, um, I do a bit of writing as well but I kind of ended up illustrating and um, I guess most importantly illustrating a successful science series um, for children sort of aged 8 to 12 year olds um, called Horrible Science. Well as I say, I trained as a designer, so I was working um, as a graphic designer and um, also a book designer, um, but I was always wanting to be an illustrator, and so I was in my spare time doing little projects, sending it to publishers, and um, I finally had a bit of luck um, and got some poems published. Um, so I had some sort of, uh, they were sort of horrible poems for children, just fun things. Um, so. I was um, visiting Scholastic Children's Books um, and I just happened to go there on the right day with my portfolio of, of work with these sort of horrible humour. Um, they'd been publishing already for two years the Horrible Histories, which have been incredibly successful in the UK. Um, so they came first and because that was starting to be successful even back in 1996, which was when I visited them, they thought, well, we can give this same treatment to um, science. And uh, it's called, it was called Horrible Histories and therefore Horrible Science. So they were looking for somebody who could sort of um, have this sort of horrible take on things. But of course they're non-fiction, so you're getting information across, but you're trying to make it fun as well. Um, and so I did some tests for them, um, I got the job, and um, very, being very lucky, it's kept me busy for like 18 years. The, the publishers uh, have been great over the years, they've given us quite a bit of flexibility, so we'd go to meetings and come in with ideas um, for titles, and I've been lucky, as an illustrator, I've been included in this as well. Um, I mean, for instance, uh, we did a book called Painful Poison, which I was very enthusiastic about, and you know they went with it, and we, we did the book. Um, but also, the, the publishers obviously have their, their ideas as well. So that would come out of a meeting. We might do a book on this, a book on that. And then, um, really, my brief comes from Nick's text. Um, he goes away and researches, um, does an incredible amount of work. Um, and then I sort of step in a bit further along the chain when he's done a lot of work with the um, editors and I've got the text. In fact, it even goes to um, typeset pages so that what I'm working from is, I mean, I would have been given the manuscript earlier just to have a read through and a think about um, just in like a word format. But when I actually start work, I would get um, the book, the page layouts. Um, it's been useful because I trained as a designer and a book designer. Um, I can actually work straight onto the page layout so I can move text around. And again, the publishers are great. They've given me the flexibility to do this, um, which isn't always the way an illustrator would work. You know, they wouldn't really normally have anything to do with the type and the page layout. So, um, yeah, so I get the, the page layouts and basically there are gaps <laughs> where I have to draw pictures and fit them in. Um, now, Obviously, I have to read the text very closely and try and get inside Nick's head and what, what he's trying to say. And he develops characters who crop up in the book. Some of them appear in lots of different titles, the same characters. Um, and so they're like sort of devices for getting the information across. And uh, so I read the text very carefully. Now, sometimes if we're trying to show a particular sort of bit of scientific information, I might have to very uh, closely follow Nick's instructions um, and his captions as well, um, because everything's sort of heavily captioned. Um, and he'd send me references. 
as well. Um, and yet other times there might be a gap. And he it's nice, actually. This is the bit I enjoy where Nick and also the publishers trust me enough to know that, you know, we need a picture here and leave me to one, maybe even do a little bit of research of my own to get my angle on how it should be shown. Because okay. um, we're trying to sort of explain things to eight to 12 year old children. So I think, I don't know why, but my brain seems to be quite, quite good at converting um, bits of information into sort of, um, uh, well, hopefully reasonably easily understood uh, drawings and so on. Um, so they give me the freedom to do that. And also, they give me the freedom to come up with um, my own humour. Sometimes I'm illustrating Nick's jokes, but mm. quite often they just let me try and extract some sort of take or some sort of humour from what might be quite quite a dry bit of text. Um, and uh, I'm, ho I'm hoping, you know, you have to sort of blow your own trumpet a bit, but I think that's probably, you know, why they quite like to use my work, because... Um, it's not just drawing the pictures, probably even more importantly is actually sort of coming up with the ideas and, and the jokes and trying to extract the humour. If there is, it's, it's nothing that's been written down or, or agreed on, you know. Um, I don't know, it just, you find a way of working that, that works and a lot, a lot of what you come up with is just sort of you just sort of subconsciously feel is right somehow, you know, just a sort of feel for it. Um, but, I mean, yeah, humour is obviously the the main thing. I mean, it's called horrible science and we've got horrible histories and horrible geography and so on. And, yes, it's horrible, but there's, you know, there's, there's lines that can't be stepped over. So you, you have to be careful about just how horrible you make it. There's something about historical stuff, and it's the same with, obviously, with... with histories, horrible histories, but and also with the horrible science. I mean, the, as I'm sure you agree, that the history of these uh, subjects is some of the most uh, interesting bits, you know. And there is something about, I don't know why, but if you go back 200 years or 300 years and you're talking about something really, really horrible that happened to somebody, it's not quite as bad mm. as if it happened last week, you know. Um, so... You can sort of use use history. I talk about I, I do I talk to children a lot actually. I go to a lot of schools and book festivals and so on, and uh, I tell them about um, an Italian because we talk about digestion and I get them to draw the digestive system, you know. And uh, when we get to the stomach, I, I tell them about a, a scientist called Lazzaro Spallanzani who was alive about three hundred years ago, and he studied sick, and uh, you know he ate stuff. <laughs> Uh, he ate stuff and then he, he sicked it up on a plate and had a look at it after a minute, this was, and it was still quite lumpy. And um, he, he ate his own sick, you know, he got a spoon, popped it back inside his stomach for an hour and then was sick again and, and it wasn't quite so lumpy. And then he, I tell the children he had to get a straw now and <laughs> suck it back. But I don't know, I made that bit up. But he does, he does eat it again and um, this time he leaves it in for a... An hour, I don't know, an hour and a half or something. I mean, he's he's finding out about digestive juices and uh, you know how how the stomach uh, breaks down the food and so on. And you know, it's true. That's the thing. It's a true story. And that, I suppose that's the essence of horrible science: is that they're non-fiction. It's all true, and uh, you can learn a lot and capture their imagination by um, telling them horrible stuff. You know. It can't all be horrible, but that's a, that is a particularly good one.